please open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we'll be meditating verses 3 through 13. 1 Peter chapter 1. <coughs> Verses 3 through 13 is the scripture portion we'll be meditating upon for this evening. And uh, probably from the uh, from the encouragement or the request I made, you already understood what is the focus of my message today for this evening for us. Right? And also I did mention that we are continuing to look into the theme of works. Okay. We know that we don't get saved because of our good works, but because we are saved, we are required to do good works. So we will continue in the same theme. So in that, uh, uh, I mean, like in order for us to get a better understanding of what kind of works or why we should have works, what I want us to consider today is what do we have in our salvation? What is it that we have in our salvation? Or what does it mean? to have salvation and thereby what are the expectations we have as far as salvation is concerned. Okay, so this uh, uh, particular passage will be talking about the expectations of salvation and there are three expectations I want to present today and uh, if you remember uh, these three words, these three key words, hopefully it will help you to remember this passage. It is talking about expectations, yes, right and then it is talking about exaltation, meaning we should be rejoicing, exaltation. We'll be rejoicing and two is exaltation. We need to glorify God because of the salvation. And three, we need to be having exhilaration. What is exhilaration? Extreme joy, especially when something is revealed to us. Amen. Okay, so when we consider our salvation, there is something that we will be looking at which is a revelation and it is a climactic revelation. Okay, in salvation we can see climax, how the history or before the foundations of uh, the world, salvation was planned and it was accomplished. But what we will be looking at will be uh, other kind of uh, revelation which we will be seeing or uh, climactic uh, revelations or climax we will be considering. Therefore, we need to have exhilaration. So, exaltation, exaltation and exhilaration will be the three uh, keywords we will be looking at as far as expectations of salvation are concerned. Alright, so now with that introduction, let us consider the first expectation which is exaltation. Alright, exaltation or rejoicing. Now, in order for us to understand, let us start reading from verse 3 wherein it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, but when we say blessed, here we are meaning that we are praising God. We are blessing God. Okay, and why are we blessing God? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again. So why, why should we be uh, blessing God or praising God? For two reasons. Okay, one, because of His mercy, but how did that mercy be uh, manifested? It is by, big, or uh, hath begotten us again, meaning He has caused us to be born again. Right? Mm -hmm. So because He has caused us to be born again, we are blessing Him. But whom are we blessing? We are blessing God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we are giving and offering praises to our God and Savior, I mean God and uh, the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercies hath begotten us. Now when we talk about uh, hath begotten us, right, we need to have a little bit of clarity. I am positive that many here, because we have been Christians for a long time, we are very familiar with this uh, uh, subject of being born again. Nevertheless, it will always be helpful for us to get uh, uh, reminded. Therefore, I want us to look at uh, a few verses from Book of John. Book of John chapter 3. Book of John chapter 3 and verse 3 states as follows. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Okay, so when Jesus said this, obviously in personal evangelism we said Nicodemus freaked out. He did not know what it meant. Right? Can I go into my mother's womb and be born again? That was the question he raised. So how did Jesus clarify? We will see in verses 3 or uh, chapter 3 verses 5 to 6 and it reads as follows. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit. So if a person should be born again, there are two ways in which the person should be born. One of water, which is the natural birth, and born again of the spirit. Okay, except a man be born, uh, born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. So the first birth is of flesh, a human birth. A human father and a human mother caused a human birth which is birth according to the flesh. So it says that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So when we talk about being born again, we are talking about a spiritual birth or being born by the spirit. right? And uh, so uh, when here we say God has caused us to be born again or God hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. We are talking about this spiritual birth. God has caused us to have this spiritual birth. And further reading it says, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. So what do we mean by this lively hope? Okay, we have hope. Generally when we talk about hope, I hope this would happen. I hope this can happen. I hope I can have good health if we are not having good health. I hope I can buy a new car because my car is old. Well, I mean, like, you know, recently I've been envious of uh, Brother Jim's truck. So he started allowing me to drive his truck. Ah. Right? And uh, so, I mean, like, you know, whenever we are hoping something, okay, we are desiring or we are hoping that it may or may not happen. Or we are wishing. Good. I mean, it would have been good if I can have such and such a thing. But here we are talking about a lively hope. But the lively hope here we need to understand is that uh, the hope is because of the facts we are looking at. Okay. Now, what are the facts we are looking at? We have meditated, uh, meditated upon this passage last Sunday, but it will help us to get clarity on our subject. So let us look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 to 6 and it reads as follows But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ He has made alive together with Jesus Christ We have meditated upon this and we have understood that along with Jesus resurrection we were also resurrected from our spiritual death Right? And further it says, quickened us together with Christ, by grace we are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So he's also raised us. Jesus was ascended into heaven, he has raised us also into heaven, and Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, we are seated at heavenly places. That is the kind of a hope we are talking about when we say lively hope. It doesn't mean I mean, like, you know, sometimes we talk about a lively document. When we talk about a lively document, what we are saying? It is changing, therefore it is a living document. Right? Today we have a plan, but tomorrow because of the circumstances that have got revealed, we have to alter the plan or refine the plan. In that sense, the document is a living document. That is not the kind of a hope we are talking about. We are not having a changing hope. We are having a hope about what we have already uh, from the scriptures of what has been revealed to us and that is all based on Jesus accomplishment and it is in parallel to how it has been unfolded in Jesus Christ. Okay, so that is what we are talking about when we are talking about a living hope or a lively hope and that is particularly relevant and related to Jesus resurrection because of what we read further. It says again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascension and his uh, being seated at the right hand of the Father is why we have that lively hope and it is 
similar in nature. And in verse 4 it says, to an inheritance. What kind of an inheritance we have? Incorruptible, undefiled, and that which fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So the kind of uh, uh, hope we have is that we will be having inheritance. What kind of inheritance? It is undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. It is reserved for us. So it is not something that we are hoping or we are wishing, but it is something which is being revealed and reserved for us in heaven. And uh, further reading it says, uh, it is reserved for us who are kept by the power of God. Look at this also. I mean, we keep considering this, right? We are once saved, saved forever. But that salvation has to be a true salvation. It is not a, uh, like, you know, just a belief based on something which has happened and someone who has told us that we are saved. No, it, it has to be a true salvation. And if it is a true salvation, that salvation is be, will be kept by God, not by ourselves. So each time mm -hmm. we sin, it doesn't mean that we are losing salvation. Nevertheless, it requires that we confess our sins. As we read in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, wherein it says, uh, if we confess our sins, God is faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't it? So that is a requirement. So God knows that we might sin again. However, in humility, we have to humble ourselves and we need to confess our sins and we need to request God to forgive our sins. Right? So, uh, however, keeping of a salvation is done by God and that is also a great hope for us, isn't it? If it is within ourselves, right. there is every possibility that we will be losing it every second of our life. Or maybe some people might lose their salvation every minute of their life. Okay? Or some people, if they are extremely good, extremely spiritual, they might reserve or keep it for one hour of their lives. Beyond that, they will lose their salvation. So it is a great hope, it is a lively hope, and also it is already accomplished, and it, it will be kept by God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice. So Christians should already be rejoicing greatly. Here, these, I mean, like, you know, these people, Peter is writing to the dispersed. They were dispersed because they were under persecution. Because of the great persecution which arose, people dispersed to various places. And in those places, because I mean they are suffering currently, but in spite of that, Peter is able to say that ye are greatly rejoicing. Right? Today in our country, in the United States, things are not being too favorable for Christians. Okay, so we might in the future, many people have this fear that very near future, in the very near future, if things continue the way things are kind of, uh, progressing now, there will be a point in time wherein there could be great persecution. And so, if we are like these people who are in dispersion, we should also be having the ability to greatly rejoice. Amen. Okay, that is the reason why I said a Christian is required to rejoice or acceleration. We have to have that acceleration and rejoicing, right? So, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, if need be, tomorrow we might also have a need. And it could be only for a season because everything will pass away. What is permanent is what is in eternity. Therefore, it says, if need be, ye are, sorry, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. There are manifold temptations. There are manifold temptations, meaning trials. Now we might not have all the kind of trials today. We may be anticipating and in that anticipation we might be anxious of manifold temptations or trials in our country also. Some persecution might happen. Nevertheless, that will be only for a time and if need be, it is not guaranteed that we will struggle, but if there is a need, we might be in heaviness for a little while. Nevertheless, we should have that great rejoicing which these people in dispersions were having. 
Right? Amen. So the first encouragement for us is for us to understand that there has to be acceleration. There has to be rejoicing because of the salvation we have. So that is the first expectation. And the second expectation is exaltation. We should be not just rejoicing but also glorifying God because of the salvation. And we see that from verse 7 onwards wherein it says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. It must be unto praise and honor and glory. Therefore, we should be glorifying God or we should be exalting God. Now, uh, there are a couple of things we need to understand. What does it say? The trial of your faith being much more precious than gold. Is gold precious? How many women here would like to have more gold? I mean, not in the United States, but you go to India, you will see people decorated with gold, uh, like, you know, as if you are decorating a horse for your ride. Huh. I mean, that much of jewelry people wear. Right? Even men wear a lot of jewelry in uh, the oriental cultures. Right? Uh, pastor is looking around to see if my wife is wearing any jewelry. <laughs> but now she is in the United States and so she is not wearing much of jewelry. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Alright. Yeah. So, nevertheless, what does it say here? Go. I mean, our trial of faith is much more precious. That is the reason even if we have trials, we should be rejoicing. And uh, also, we should be giving glory to God. Therefore, it says, trial of your faith <clears throat> being much more precious than gold that perishes. Because gold will perish. Though it be, I mean, however, your faith or the trial of your faith, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When will, we, <clears throat> when will that be unto the praise and the honor and glory is that when Jesus appears. And further in verse 8 it says, Whom having not seen, ye love. None of us have seen God or uh, have seen Jesus Christ, isn't it? We have only believed the witness which was given to us through the scriptures and also through various preachers and teachers. Therefore, we also belong to this category wherein we are loving uh, Jesus even though we have not seen. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable. Amen. Does it apply to us? Are we rejoicing with joy yes. unspeakable? That's the question which is necessary for us to ask today. Yeah, in an anticipation of the persecution that could arise, we might be anxious. But why are we anxious of something which is not certain yet and not rejoicing in something we already have if we are not rejoicing? I hope that is not the case with, uh, in our case. If that is the case, let us consider what we have in salvation and start considering and uh, start having this joy unspeakable and further it says and full of glory so ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory there has to be glory in us today here on this earth even if things are not going according to what we want in the society in general because what you have within you should determine the kind of joy you will have the kind of glory you will have not what is uh, there outside of us right so the salvation we have should allow us to be having that joy and further finally it says in verse 9 receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls salvation of your souls is the reason why we should be having everything and our faith is so that we will have that salvation right so these people who were in persecution were uh, were able to rejoice that way now, when we talk about the, uh, our uh, trial of faith, okay, and we say it is precious than gold, right? So all this trial will ultimately give us rewards. Ultimately, it will give us rewards when we go to heaven. So if we go through any suffering, we should consider that to be a blessing. Count it all joy when manifold temptations come to you. That's another encouragement we have in book of James, isn't it? So how does it work out? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 13 to 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 13 to 15 states as follows. 
every man's work shall be manifested for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire will be tried by fire even our good works or bad works and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burnt he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire so we might uh, i mean here it's clear that we might not lose our salvation if the salvation if our deeds are bad nevertheless every good work we have will be ultimately tried and accordingly we will be rewarded in heaven when we face the judgment so i mean like you know we need to understand yes there may be trials here too and there will be trial there too but that trial is only for our rewards okay here the trials which we have we should be able to bear and withstand because these are, i mean if we are not able to sustain ourselves and our faith till the end again it is kept by god but at the same time we see many people who reject the faith that rejection is a test whether to start with their salvation was true whether their faith was true or not so it is not the question of losing salvation they were never saved yes that is the understanding we need to have that is the clarity we need to have therefore if we have salvation we have to be rejoicing if our salvation is true if we have salvation we have to have the glory which this passage is talking about amen okay therefore there is a need for us not to just be exhilarated but also we need to have exaltation we need to exalt god and we need to have that glory within us too and finally the third uh, thought which i wanted to present today is exposition something will be exposed to us okay and what is that which is uh, being exposed it is the salvation the, there is uh, i mean like you know a, a great amount of work which happened or there is a suspense here okay there is an intrigue we'll see what that intrigue is and the intrigue is i mean let me uh, give the outline because we are talking about exposition or intrigue it says in this passage that prophets have inquired about the salvation which will be given to us prophets have inquired two the spirit of christ has signified spirit of christ has given signs to the prophets to let them know uh, something about the salvation we'll talk about that too and uh, third the preachers who are witnessing they are witnessing to what has been recorded by the prophets and which has been revealed during the apostolic time and finally the angels had a desire to see this okay that is the kind of a tension going on angels are waiting to see what's happening okay prophets they searched to see what kind of salvation and when it will be accomplished and then we have jesus christ the spirit of jesus christ revealing to the prophets so understand the uh, magnitude or the uh, the the greatness of the salvation which has been accomplished through his son jesus christ right so how do we know that because in verse 10 onwards it says of which salvation the prophets have inquired what did they inquire and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you what is the grace which has come unto you the salvation which has come unto the people in dispersion dispersion of that day and which has come unto each one of us here sitting in this pews okay so the prophets have searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you searching what or what manner of time they were not just searching for what salvation they are not talking about just the salvation but also they were concerned about the timing and that timing was revealed to us in book of daniel okay uh, book of daniel uh, chapter 9 verses 24 to 27 i mean when we we'll, uh, read this passage it is a longer passage therefore we might not go into the details of exposition of what it means but clearly you can talk i mean you can see the timing of messiah when he will be dying when he will rise again or the circumstances so let's read that and i'll very quickly read and point out only a few uh, important verses there or phrases it says verse 24 Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins 
and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to the restoring to the build uh, to build jerusalem unto here uh, i mean uh, pay attention here to build jerusalem unto the messiah the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks the street shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times and after three scores okay this is what might be more relevant and after three score and two weeks shall the messiah cut off but not for himself messiah did not die for himself messiah will be cut off but he did not die for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined so here clearly we see that the messiah will be cut off but it is not for himself and we are also uh, seeing that it will be seven weeks and three score weeks and two weeks and so on and so forth so this when you apply it to jesus christ he talks about the three and a half uh, uh, years of ministry after which he will die and then after he will uh, be resurrected again so on and so forth so here the uh, like you know, the prophecy in book of daniel talks about specifically the timing according to which the salvation will be revealed okay now we need to also understand when prophecy is given it could be talking about the immediate situation and also it could be talking about the future in which the prophecy will be fulfilled in a greater way fashion say for example i mean this is the best example therefore i keep quoting it when we talk about a virgin birth it might have got accomplished or fulfilled in the days of isaiah but again in jesus christ it got fulfilled with a greater meaning right that is how we can see here therefore we can see the timing uh, uh, which the prophets have searched and further it says here and what manner of time the spirit of christ okay Okay, let, let me read uh, verse 11 again just to get clarity. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Who is the spirit of Christ? Is it Jesus himself? Yes, brother. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay, so how do we understand that it is the Holy Spirit we are talking about? Okay, let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21 says here for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man okay prophecy was not uh, coming out by the will of man but how but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit so when we talk about the spirit of Christ revealing this information about the salvation and the timing Peter is clarifying that came through the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit which we are talking about. Right? So <clears throat> the prophets, they prophesied based on the moving of the Holy Spirit. And further it says, when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. So Christ will suffer. True. But there is also glory which had to follow and that was prophesied. Further it says, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel. Again as I said earlier, every one of us have received Christ because someone has preached to us. And when that someone has preached to us, it was by the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit that they have preached and that is the reason why we accepted. If it was just by the, their own abilities by their own communication skills and their own wisdom, we would not have received Christ because Holy Spirit and God is necessary part of drawing us to His Son, Jesus Christ. Right? So every preacher who has caused that salvation in you caused it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? And further it says here, <clears throat> not unto the, I mean, reading once again, not unto themselves, but unto us it uh, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost 
sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look. Okay, so the angels are desiring to look. So try to understand the magnitude of intrigue which is there within this short few verses wherein it says, prophets have inquired and spirit of Christ has signified and preachers have witnessed and then finally the angels have desired to see the salvation which was accomplished in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, so when we consider this kind of magnitude of salvation we have, is there any reason for us not to be glorifying God or exalting God? No, there is no reason. Is there any reason for us not to be rejoicing or having exaltation? No, there is no reason. And finally, is there any reason for us not to, uh, not to have revelation or clarity about our salvation? Yes, that was an intrigue, but now that it is revealed in the scriptures, we have clarity. So because of that exposition, okay, what do we do now, right? Verse 13, uh, I'll not read uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, the whole passage there, but verse 13 will give us an encouragement of how we need to receive this knowledge. And it says here, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, sober and hope to the end for the grace that is, uh, the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what are we to do? We need to gird up our lions. Lions of our minds. We should have the right mindset. If we read further, there is an uh, I mean, encouragement for us to have good works. Or in other words, this is, uh, I mean, there is an encouragement for us to exert ourselves. We need to exert ourselves. We need to tirelessly uh, strive and uh, accomplish what God's purpose is for us and we clearly know that God's will I mean from the Great Commission which we have meditated this morning we clearly know that we need to teach to follow all the commandments which Jesus has uh, commanded us right we need to make disciples right with that uh, encouragement uh, let's close let me close with a word of prayer dear Heavenly Father I thank you Lord for all the mercies you have showered upon us and Lord, most of all, I thank you for the scriptures you have given to us through the inspiration of your spirit. And Lord, I also thank you for the encouragement we have today. I thank you for the expectations you have laid for because of the salvation we have. I thank you for the encouragement we have to be rejoicing and glorifying and also uh, have the clarity of our salvation. Thereby, we can have the confidence to do your work on this earth and accomplish your purpose which is for us to make disciples. May that purpose you have for us be fulfilled in each one of our lives. I pray in Jesus' name.